Today we have with us Mr. Steve Gu. Mr. Steve Gu is the CEO and co-founder of iFi Inc. Um, iFi is working on automating the convenience store process and we're looking into what the future of retail and automation will look like in the future. So thank you so much, Steve, for being here. Well, thank you for inviting, Chris. In addition, this entire event is dedicated to the Dewar the World Initiative. If you're looking into this, um, please check out our website and please check out our Facebook event page to learn more about how you can donate and support their initiative. Mm, so without further ado, um, we'll st go straight into our interview. So Steve, um, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Gu. Uh, I am the CEO and the co-founder of iFi. Uh, so I, I, you know, I have been working in this tech industry for a very long time. Uh, I got my PhD from Duke University, uh, major in computer vision. Uh, I, I publish a lot of research papers in the field of computer vision and AI uh, before uh, the startup. And uh, uh, after graduation, I first worked at Apple. Uh, at the Human Interface Device Group. Um, I was working on this called the so-called 3D Touch. So if, if you're using the older generation of iPhones and iPads, you were, you're probably using uh, some of my inventions or co-invented with my colleagues back in 2012. Uh, that was a very fun time for me. Uh, and then I uh, uh, moved over to Google, uh, working at the Google X, the so-called Moonshot Factory. Uh, I was in the Google Glass team uh, that time was a very sen sensational project, you know, the one, one of the world's first uh, augmented reality glass where you can uh, use your eyes and hands to control the glass and uh, it's going to take photos. Uh, you can it had this uh, see-through screen that you can see a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, I, I actually won a couple of innovation awards there at the Google X. Um, unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, the, the glass project didn't pan out really well in the end. It kind of wind it down uh, gracefully. Um, I, and then in 2015, I then left uh, Google. Uh, I was thinking about uh, what to do next. Uh, I first uh, uh, published a book with a few co-authors. Uh, it was a book talking about um, the future technologies and uh, some science fiction uh, stuff. Um, and, and then in 2016, uh, we co-founded this company called the iFi, AIFI. Uh, it's uh, the idea is to make AI as widely accessible as Wi-Fi is, hence the name uh, iFi. Uh, yeah, happy to share more about iFi. Um, if any questions, happy to answer about that. Of course, um, and we'll get into that very soon. Um, so, actually, the first question is: You've been to Google, you've been to Apple. What led you to? leave these like large scale companies to go to a entrepreneurial startup and what has been the transition uh, it's a while ago but how was the transition yeah well for me it's you know this uh, entrepreneur mindset is always uh, very attractive to me uh, i uh, I, I love steve jobs and i you know i model them and adore them i think that um uh, it's also for me. It's also like naturally happening because you know the Google Glass project didn't really go well in the end. So uh, a lot of team members they left the project. Some move on to other projects in Google. Some others they, they left the company. They started their own um, companies. Um, uh, I think it's also a great opportunity for me uh, because uh, previously I was always thinking about uh, uh, how to um, apply my domain expertise into some. Uh, uh, specialty, some verticals to, to really uh, make a dent. Um, and uh, it, it just came somehow this great opportunity where uh, uh, it so happened that we know some angel investors and uh, we talk about some initial projects. They got excited about the uh, iFi as well. So we decided to just do it. <laughs> I see. Um, yeah, I think that transition is so difficult and um, it's so many people are stuck in the same route and it's very difficult to move out of it. Yeah. But tell us a little bit about iFi. Um, iFi is trying to automate the process of convenience stores. And how are you going about doing this? And what is the technology behind it? Yeah, so uh, at iFi, so we are automating the world's uh, stores. So we developed a very advanced uh, computer vision and sensing technologies. 
to enable the system to be able to monitor who is grabbing what in real time inside a real uh, shopping environment. Um, it, it, it's, I, I think that it's, it's, even though it's doing its very inception stage, it's already grabbing a lot of attention from both media and from the shoppers and from customers. Uh, we actually launched uh, almost 10 stores last year. Uh, you probably heard uh, uh, a few uh, announcements from us. Uh, we have one store in Silicon Valley, one store in Netherlands, another one uh, in Shanghai, in China. So uh, we have been uh, developing the technology very rapidly these days to enable this uh, unique experience. Mm -hmm. um, IFI is also very uh, unique in the sense that uh, we are, you probably heard about Amazon Go, where um, you know, people can walk in, grab stuff and leave. However, that um, their solution is quite expensive and uh, uh, it's, it's also a still in its early stage. We, on the other hand, uh, because our mission is to make AI as widely accessible as Wi-Fi is, so we try to make the solution uh, very low cost, very easy to deploy, and very friendly to use. Um, and today our customers range from very large retailers, internationally well-recognized retailers uh, in both Europe and the US, and also in Asia, uh, we're also working with some of the mom and pop shops uh, to empower the stores to run 24-7 nonstop. Hmm. I see. And just to talk a little bit more about that. So we're imagining the future of I go into a store and I pick up something from a shelf and then the computer vision technology is able to track what I pick up. And um, when I leave, I can automatically, uh, I need a cards or something that's connected to the store to swipe out and check out? Yeah, so, well, in fact, it's a, it's a checkout free, right? So you don't even need to check out. So basically you can use a cell phone app to scan a QR code in, or you can use a credit card or debit card to swipe, to tap uh, in the entrance to walk in. And once you are inside, you can just shop as usual. Uh, you can grab stuff, you can inspect the items, you can return the items back to the shelves. Uh, our system is able to uh, track multiple people shopping simultaneously in the store. And once you are done shopping, you can just leave. There's no checkout, there's no waiting, there's no lines, everything is uh, automatic. And uh, if you're using a cell phone, you will be able to see the receipts uh, popping up on the cell phone uh, automatically. Uh, in contrast with Amazon Go, which the receipts might take uh, minutes and sometimes hours to, to get, uh, our system can provide you this real-time receipts so that you can, you can really, in, in fact, the entire shopping journey can be just redu reduced to a few seconds, right? Imagine that you are catching up a train where you can just walk in, grab stuff and leave. And uh, I think it's one of the world's fastest uh, shopping experience. That's very interesting. And Okay, so if there's two products right next to each other, one is a 120 gram chip and then one is an 80 gram chip, how is the computer vision technology able to know that's which is which? Yeah, we actually call the, the technology in the broader terms called a sensor fusion. Uh, so it's it composed of cameras on the ceilings and in some corners. And we also instrument the sensors into the shelves. And uh, it's basically a combination of uh, ambient sensing and the computer vision to uh, enable the system to understand who is grabbing what and to be able to discern uh, which product is which, right? So imagine that uh, these two items are very adja uh, placed adjacent to each other. They might have similar appearance, but they have different locations or they have uh, similar locations, but they have different weights or they have different appearance. So we use the combination of that attributes to distinguish the items. Um, yeah, our system is also able to uh, keep track of the shoppers. Uh, uh, we actually have very advanced technologies that uh, is able to track hundreds and thousands of people uh, shopping simultaneously in an environment, uh, I think which is very cool uh, mm. to demonstrate. Yeah, and in that process, you collect the data of the people who, who are coming in and going out, and what kind of information do you collect, and, and how is that benefiting the mom and pop stores and different retailers who are using this information? Uh, we are not really collecting any information. So all the, we use all the, all the on-prem uh, on computing to um, 
grab the images of the, the environment and out of the person and uh, running deep learning models and neural nets on top to understanding what's happening there. And once the shopper is out of the store, the data is um, uh, dissolved. Uh, we don't store anything. Uh, the reason for that is because we are actually working with uh, several major retailers in Europe. Mm -hmm. There's this called the GDPR law that uh, specifically prevents you from storing any uh, sensitive data, biometrics related data without the user consent. Uh, the beauty of our system and our CCS is that uh, the system should be able to operate uh, seamlessly without uh, violating any user privacy laws and in the meantime can provide this, um, this uh, real-time uh, shopper experience. I see, I see. And mm, so one big competition is Amazon Go. And I think recently, just earlier this year, they launched a products saying that they can license or, or utilize their technology for Amazon Go and give it to different stores that want to use it. Um, what, what was your response to this news and why do you think iFi is different from, from the product that Amazon Go is proposing? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> well, I think for, first of all, the general trend of the macro environment is that, that the whole world is moving towards autonomous. Right, so you know, self-driving cars, you know, smart home, and uh, uh, it's reasonable to expect that uh, all the physical retail shops will become autonomous as well. Uh, and Amazon Go is uh, uh, one great example uh, where you know it, I think that, that there's a lot of positive reviews about the Amazon Go today. Um, uh, at iFi, we are uh, actually pursuing a, a quite different task. It's almost in parallel with what Amazon Go is doing. Because to begin with, um, Amazon Go was essentially operating their own stores. And you know, as a, as a trillion dollar company, they don't really care that much about the cost, about uh, uh, the retailer's actual demand and needs, right? So we, on the other hand, uh, work with retailers to begin with. So we understand deeply about the, what the retailers uh, want. Uh, they need to worry about the inventory management. They want to know how to run the store most efficiently, and they don't want to disrupt their stores either. So from a retrofitting perspective, for example, today if, you, uh, if the ask is to how to retrofit existing store to make it automated, that question is actually very different from launching a new store, which you can do whatever to the store uh, to make it automated. So we are working with constraints and bounds to begin with. Um, and second is that we are not really competing with any retailers because we are a technology firm by heart. Um, our, uh, our unique strengths are in the algorithms, are in the sensors, in the cameras, um, not in the store operations or, or retail uh, assortment, uh, category assortment uh, and those issues. So we choose to work with retailers to make this happen. Um, as opposed to uh, Amazon Go, when they have this very large online e-commerce platform, in a sense, they are also competing with retailers. So I think that uh, in the long run, um, uh, I, I believe that uh, m most of the major retailers, uh, they, they, are, they will be very reluctant to work with Amazon, and that gives us uh, opportunities to work with them instead. I see. So as a, almost like a third party, you have a better view of the entire ecosystem, and you're able to better work and, and collaborate with other retailers. Yeah. So, I see. Um, interesting. And, but on the same note, um, the technology, is it scalable or is it different? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, well, of course, we are still in the middle of launching many more stores in the years to come. Uh, but today, if, if you just look at today, uh, our clients, uh, we have a small nano stores, which only about 160 square foot and all the way to a typical convenience store about 2,000 square foot, and to supermarkets, which is about 8,000 to 10,000 square foot of that range. So our technology is designed to be scalable. Uh, and to that end, uh, so we basically design our system to be microservice-based archi uh, architecture, so that uh, uh, we and, uh, embed into the algorithms to make the fully distributed, so that the, the technology can scale uh, to a very large size store. There's no physical limit to the technology. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's a physical limit to the cost, right? So what we are actually trying to optimize is to find the most cost-effective solution so that we can deploy the solutions both in small format stores and also in large formats too. I see. So paint us a picture um, in the future. 
30 years later, uh, what will, if we go into a retail store, if we go into any store, what do you envision is the customer experience? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> it actually goes back to the root of iFi. Uh, so like Wi-Fi is uh, permeating through the physical space, uh, we hope that iFi would one day be as pervasive as, as Wi-Fi is. Uh, you could also argue that Wi-Fi is today is almost a basic human right, right? So you can't live without a Wi-Fi. That connectivity is very important to, to everyone. Uh, and hopefully uh, one day iFi can also be something that is essential to the, to the society. Um, it's also, if you uh, look at um, this uh, architecture that uh, we're drawing, uh, even today it sounds, it sounds very daunting because if you walk into the store, you will see a fleet of cameras on the ceiling. You will see a fleet of sensors almost everywhere. Um, but uh, like, like what the Wi-Fi is, is it becomes eventually uh, invisible, right? So you don't really, really care where the router is. And we envision that in the future, this infrastructure for AI is also becoming uh, invisible, right? So the, the whole set of cameras and sensors, those devices will become ambient and will come, become essentially dissolved into the environment. Uh, in a sense that the environment itself uh, is, is AI, right? The environment can learn how to think, how to sense, how to smell, uh, how to sense the vibrations, um, how to understand the activities, uh, how to recognize products. Uh, essentially, those sensors and cameras will will be dissolved uh, in, and uh, and uh, changed uh, and upgraded to be essentially just like dust, right? Those tiny sensors can sense, uh, do everything. So that's the, the idea we have. Uh, we believe that in, in 30 years from now, um, uh, you go to re retail shops, it just looks like a normal convenience store. It just looks like uh, any shop you would have today, but it's fully digital. Uh, in a sense that it understands what's happening uh, in the store. And, and maybe the technology is not only limited to just the retail shop, it can also be applicable to shopping centers, movie theaters, uh, university campus, um, your home, um, all the ambient environment. Um, I see. I think this is, will be something that uh, is very attractive to us. So you said it would almost dissolve. Uh, just to clarify it, in what way will it dissolve? Is it because the technology will be nearly invisible or not be able to be detected? Or is it because there'll be so much technology everywhere, there'll be so many cameras everywhere that we will just get used to it? Um, it it's probably more than that. So today, if you look at that phone, you know, that's an intelligent device. But, you know, this AIoT, right? So there's a, there's a buzzword for that called AIoT. It's AI plus IoT. Uh, if you look at the future, the evolution of that, it means that the daily objects and um, the gadgets like your pen and everything can, can think because the, the edge computing device becomes so small and so tiny and, and, and uh, you, uh, you can barely see that. Right? And, and also that um, it's not just about the cameras. There are lots of uh, unique sensors there in the world too that can uh, tell the, the smell, the vibrations, the haptics, and all those things. So it's the combined, uh, the sensing field that would enable these things to happen. I see. And yes, so that technological change is not available now, but how long do you, does it take for this process to change? Um, and, and do you think like this requires in the future 5G technology to be rampant or does it require anything specific to like meet the conditions so that this is be able to spread? Uh, I think that uh, um, the autonomous store is one great example that can become reality very soon. It's almost the reality today, right? So I mean, Amazon's already having 20, 30 stores there and we, we have a dozen stores there too. Uh, it's just that the infrastructure is still pretty heavy. Uh, so you will see that the adoption curve initially is very slow because it's also very expensive. Uh, the, the underlying technology is also rapidly developing. So every, every week, every month, you see uh, the, the new publications from research at the academia about uh, the more efficient neural net models, uh, low, uh, more efficient computing devices, uh, better neural network architectures. And from the sensing field, you see more efficient devices and, uh, and low power devices, even wireless charging, all those things. So I, I believe that all those things are, 
uh, converging to a sweet spot where those uh, uh, what we call ambient sensing will happen very very soon. Uh, and you are talking about thirty year time span. Uh, come on, that's a very long time. Right? So I think the, the uh, there's one guy, one great guy. I forgot his name. He was saying the best way to predict the future is to create it. Right. So I think that we are the ones creating the future and. Um, and hopefully in 30 years, that's the reality. Yeah. That's very true. Uh, most of the students who are watching this are um, Penn students or, or college students. And I think um, we are trying to create the future and um, we're, we're learning from you as well. But uh, with that said, I think what you came from an academic background and how did you transition into business and entrepreneurship? Like, what was the mindset shift in that process? Yeah, I think that uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, well, I, but when I was doing my PhD, I could just narrowly focus on one particular difficult problem mm -hmm. and, and the finding the best solution to solve it. Uh, even when I was in Apple or Google X and uh, um, usually you can focus on certain areas mm -hmm. and without worrying about the rest. For example, I can propose crazy ideas without worrying about uh, cost, without worrying about the human capital, um, without worrying about some of the, the dynamics there. Um, now, once you are doing a startup company, uh, you realize that uh, um, this problem solving or technology per se is just a, a small part of the, the whole equation. Uh, there are you know, a million variables that needs to be set right in order for the company to be successful. Uh, by the way, I said we're not saying that our company is successful yet. Uh, we want to make our company successful, but in doing so, we realize that there are a lot of things that uh, that we need to take care of. Uh, from the most of the agile relate to the human aspects, right? Um, from uh, people dynamics to, to management, to how to motivate and coordinate the team to make sure it's most productive, uh, to identifying the right direction and focus on that direction and not getting uh, distracted on that. So I think it's very important. And those things, you, they, usually, they usually don't teach you in, at school. And you, you probably have to experience that yourself in order to understand the subtleties and difficulties out of, uh, of it. Hmm. Is there a story you can share about like one of the biggest challenges you faced in starting this company and how you've tried to overcome that? Well, I, I think there were a lot of challenges. I can, I can almost, <laughs> every day we're facing a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, every week there are some decisions that might be detrimental or, to the company. Uh, so we will have to be very careful on that. W one example I can share is, um, uh, I think we started with a great dream, a very big dream. Right? I, I would say, okay, we want to make AI as widely accessible as Wi-Fi. So we, we have this vision that, uh, this infrastructure will eventually be dissolved into nothing and the intelligence will be very pervasive. However, down to earth, we still need to think about how to make money. Right? So uh, we also need to find a way to connect uh, point A to point B. Um, in so doing, we actually uh, spent quite a while understanding uh, which area we should focus on. Because eventually, even let's just say we have the best algorithm in the world that can squeeze the neural nets into a very small footprint to run on those low power devices, it doesn't mean that you can make money out of it. Uh, so in, in the, the first year, um, we basically were evaluating uh, very attentively with a few different companies, deciding which is the best route for us to monetize from. Uh, we ended up choosing focusing on this autonomous shopping simply because, um, you know, the physical retail, the, the retail combined uh, occupies almost two thirds of the world economy. So it's, it's kind of one of the largest sectors you can imagine. And that's, that's also the, happens to be the sector where AI can play um, a very important role there. So that's why we chose that. But that decision is not easy because in doing so, we're also giving up a lot of other options and, uh, and opportunities. So I think that uh, being able to evaluate and look at the opportunities, but also choosing and focusing on one and giving up the rest is actually a very difficult decision. Um, I guess that's just one example that... Uh, that, that running startups can teach you about. And what were the other options? So what is something else that you wish AI, you could have been a part of the AI revolution in? Well, 
there at that time a few, a few years ago there were potential acquisition opportunities. Some people want to just buy you for the technology you're developing. There were also, you know, we were also negotiating about contracts regarding uh, embedding those uh, uh, efficient neural nets into the edge devices. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, but that should, it's a very different application. It also make, uh, means that um, we become a pure technology firm and not a product company. So. Uh, by focusing on the autonomous uh, retail shopping and uh, building autonomous stores, so we, we decided to become a product company as opposed to just a mere technology company. So th there are some qualitative differences there. Uh, yes, and so uh, more specifically, what other industries or areas do you think AI could make a huge difference? And um, like you chose autonomous shopping, but what else? are other industries, other areas that you could have gone into that would have been very fascinating and is still very fascinating in AI? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that, well, that's, there's a lot. Uh, well, out of my mind, I can think about self-driving cars, needless to speaking, it's going to happen. <laughs> maybe flying cars, maybe something else. Uh, and then there are uh, things related to IoT, smart homes. Right, uh, your uh, your daily interactions with the objects, and in, in the sensing field, there's a lot that can happen. Uh, surveillance is one large field, um, and then there are uh, other sectors regarding, uh, for example, uh, marketing, uh, legal, uh, HR. Uh, all those fields can and should be disrupted by by AI, <laughs> right? And, and there are also other fields. Um, you mentioned about, uh, I think in the beginning of the, the this, uh, talk, you mentioned about altruism, right? Uh, altruism. So you can use AI to detect uh, those altruism, maybe to uh, find some early signs, uh, and maybe even using AI to develop uh, some practical solution to monitor and to, to as a, some preventive measure for, uh, for the altruism. So that might be a great application. And the medical is a great field too, right? So in, now you can use uh, uh, AI to uh, do the early diagnosis and, and also detect some cancer, uh, some therapy. Uh, there, there's a million, I, I guess you name it, uh, we, we can claim it. <laughs> and, and from your perspective, uh, knowing both the Chinese side of the technology and America's, um, the US side of technology, what, what is your just like general overview of like how the two countries have been um, in this tech race and w w what is your outlook and w what do you see in the future? Yeah, I was born in Shanghai in, in China. So uh, I, would, um, I knew that uh, the culture, the people there and I, I moved to the US for my study uh, and eventually stayed here in the US. Um, I, I think that, that there's, a, um, there's a very interesting uh, interplay between two different countries, a very different culture. Uh, I do see that um, uh, there are a lot of talents in, in, in both countries. Um, China is definitely, you know, uh, catch up very quickly these days. If you look at the face recognition, surveillance of those applications, almost like uh, commonplace in China now. Uh, as opposed to in US, I think there are lots of legal regulations about um, concerns and uh, things. So in that regard, it seems it's lagging behind. But on the other hand, I think that if you talk about the true innovation and the technology advancement, most of the, those innovation advancements happen in the U.S., especially in Silicon Valley. You know, it's, um, it's basically it's like a magnet sucking all of the, the talents from, from all over the, the world. But I think that's uniquely uh, attractive. Well, of course, now with uh, Trump's new ban of H-1B and all those things, and uh, who knows what's going to happen next. Um, uh, but I think that uh, this AI is uh, is a young and a promising field that sounds that seems universal across uh, countries, not only in U.S. and China, also in Europe and also in other areas as well. I see. Thank you so much for answering. Um, yes, and I think that's the first part of the interview, which is, um, and now we'll start answering questions from our audience and, and students um, who are in the in the chat, um, but. So we'll start with the first question, which is from Hannah Gonzalez. Um, and Hannah wrote, um, how has COVID um, been impacted, uh, impacting what you are doing and how your company is operating? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think that we definitely were impacted a lot by COVID-19. 
uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, from company perspective, everyone is now working from home. So we shifted the culture from working collectively in the, in the office in Silicon Valley now to basically uh, everyone working uh, at the home. So we're still getting adjusted to, to that. Uh, uh, we're not losing productivity, but it's very hard mm -hmm. because now you, uh, especially from communication perspective, but also it's very challenging regarding the client engagement because most, most of our clients are retailers and some of them, they, they suffer a lot from this COVID-19. Uh, for example, one of our uh, clients in, in UK, they originally were planning to open 50 stores with them in the airports and also in those uh, transit hubs. But now all the airports are, are shutting down and all the transit hubs are, are kind of being uh, locked down and uh, it, it basically delays the, the plan dramatically. Uh, some of our clients, they might just went bankrupt <laughs> simply because of this crisis. Uh, on the other hand, others, uh, other clients, uh, other retailers, they're kind of thriving in, in this space. You, you, they, they see a surge of uh, demand uh, because of the, the need for the, the, the life for essential goods, the grocery shopping, the PPE and all those things. So um, with those clients, we, we think that uh, uh, there's even a brighter future uh, with this technology. Uh, you can imagine that um, the autonomous shopping, the, the field that we're doing, uh, it enables uh, people to shop without uh, uh, w interacting with anyone in the store. In, in, a, in a sense, the store can is essentially run 24-7 just by itself. Right? So um, in this way, the, the people uh, doing the restocking for the store doesn't have to be in the store in the same time with the, the customers. So uh, that gives a lot of flexibility. Um, and also now that the people, now that these days people are talking about social distancing and all those things. So it's also part of our offering in the platform as well, so that we can give retailers the alerts about if anyone is violating the social distancing, we can send alerts to the store operators too. So these are some of the, <laughs> the, the, the impacts. Um, mm -hmm. We will see, we're, we're, we're closely monitoring the COVID-19 situation and, and, and it continues to adapt to that and to see how we can uh, succeed in, in this crisis. I see. Um, yes, and then the next question is, um, what is your view on the future of retail in, in general? Um, and why, uh, and, and what is your bets on retail as an industry? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So retail, um, if you look at today's retail, um, I think the majority part, the majority part of it, it has remained the same or stagnated for for decades. Right. So if you, if you look at today's uh, convenience store, today's supermarkets, today's uh, uh, mom and pop shops, it, it's not that much different from the the shops 30 years ago or 50 years ago, maybe even 100 years ago. Uh, I think there's a great chance that uh, we uh, that we can revolutionize this field. Uh, people have been talking about omni-channel sales, you know, blending the digital and the physical uh, for a time. And this COVID-19 is also accelerating the adopt adoption of the, this e-commerce platforms. You know, Amazon, JD.com, they are performing really well uh, during COVID-19. Um, I think moving forward, uh, uh, the retail needs to need and should be automated. Um, it's not only for the e-commerce part, uh, for the online part, but also for the offline, for the physical part. Uh, there's a lot of things we can automate, right? So the user experience, um, people shopping, uh, you know, Americans spend seven, uh, 37 billion hours just waiting in line in doing grocery shopping. That's just a ridiculous amount of wasted hours uh, for human capital, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there's also this availability uh, issues because today, uh, you have to drive miles to get to even a clo the, your closest shop, a convenience store, let's say 7-Eleven to shop. Uh, imagine a future where instead of having people drive to those central places to shop, you push those automated stores as close as possible to where people live and provide those essential goods 24-7 to, the, to the, those people, right? So to local communities. That means that uh, you know people should be able to access those uh, goods whenever 
and wherever they want it. Uh, those this notion of instant gratification will become real, right? So people are now patient, and and you might also imagine that during midnight time, you want you want to grab a diaper or something. Um, it would be very difficult for you to drive miles to get to that. What if there's a shop just near uh, your apartment only within five minutes walk? So that's where the shopping can be dramatically changed. And we believe these automated stores can enable that to happen. Um, and well, on top of that, you know, we can also talk about automated inventory, automated warehouse, uh, automated um, uh, analytics, and uh, and also extended hours, etc. So the, yeah, there's a lot of things uh, that that we can innovate in this field. Mm, very interesting. Um, and the next question is from uh, Vijay Lopez, um, and it is a very, very technical technical question: is how do you train the algorithms for the images which are picked up, and are they optimized for certain types of products? That's a very technical question. <laughs> Well, and, and there's no simple answer to that yet either. Uh, I think that uh, that's why there's a whole engineer team working on, on those challenging problems. Um, I do want to highlight a few things. And uh, you know, in the AI field, uh, it's not just about algorithms; it's about data, right? So I think uh, compared to algorithm data, perhaps even more important today than ever. Uh, the way we solve that problems is to create a very large scale, uh, very sophisticated simulation system. Mm -hmm. That can stimulate all sorts of shopping behavior. Uh, you can actually look look at the website, and you know we we provide some examples um, where we can simulate uh, uh, shoppers of different heights, different clothing, different hairstyle, to uh, grab items, uh, putting items back. And we also digitize all of the product items uh, in full three D format, mm -hmm. and arrange them in such a unique way that allow the neural nets to learn uh, who is grabbing what. It's not a trivial problem, but it's a very fun and interesting problem to solve. Do you mind sharing what is the accuracy of, of the product? I know Amazon Go is around 98%. Is there a, a, a number for like what is the accuracy of a current product? Uh, yeah, on our, our website, we are already showcasing some of the metrics there. It's mm -hmm. called AAA, right? So we, our system uh, is aimed to be uh, Autonomous, affordable, and accurate, triple A. Uh, so we aim to strive uh, beyond the 99% accuracy. Um, and that's our promise to the retailers, that's uh, the promise to ourselves as well. So we want to make sure that uh, the system uh, runs with impeccable accuracy so that you can open the shop to the uh, public uh, without worrying that some people might be stealing stuff, etc. Um, just want to give you a reference that uh, the natural shrink for a typical convenience store, shrink means that uh, product loss or product uh, missing I without see. knowing what's happening there anyway. Uh, the, the natural shrink for a typical convenience store is about 2 to 3%, right? Maybe 2% is known. So if we can beat that number, uh, aim for 99% accuracy, so we can even claim that this autonomous shopping is performing even better than a convenience store regarding the shrink reduction. Perfect. Um, yes, and I guess the last question we had was, I'll let you end it, but what is your advice for undergraduates and graduates now and going into this post-COVID future, what, what is your takeaway of what you want students to take away from this interview? Uh, Two things, right? So one is uh, related to COVID and one is not related to COVID. So the thing that's not related to COVID, I think uh, is, I, I think uh, our experience is that we have to dream very big, like make AI as widely uh, pervasive as Wi-Fi. Dream big, however, we also need to uh, drill down to the details and uh, understand where to start from. So, and that, that focus is very important. Um, we learned this lesson the hard way when we're doing our startups. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's something that um, uh, people should spend more time just looking into, uh, the, um, for example, the go-to-market strategies, the, the, the product, the verticals, the, the exact uh, pinpoint, the pain point they're solving. So it, it, sometimes it's, uh, it's easy to start with a grand vision, but without uh, understanding um, the real pain points, it'll be very hard to start a real business. Um, and 
the, then the second part related to COVID-19, now that things are increasingly become more um, uh, distributed, right? So people work remotely. And uh, uh, I, I think there are some unique opportunities out of it. Uh, for example, the social distancing I mentioned, uh, we didn't realize that it could be part of the uh, one feature of our product offering, mm -hmm. but now we know that. Um, uh, I think that such opportunities definitely exist today. Uh, some people are taking advantage of that. Some people are not seeing that. So I, I would encourage people to, to look into this unique characteristics of the post-COVID-19 world and see how we can innovate and create a, uh, new and exciting things out of it. So yes, dream big, but have a very strong focus and also take advantage of COVID and see new business opportunities. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for, for joining us. And um, for the audience, um, this is the Penn Innovators in Business podcast and interview. So feel free to like our page um, on Facebook and um, follow us on YouTube and I'll look at our website at wordsandinnovators.com. And finally, um, this interview is again dedicated to Dewarm the, Wo uh, Dewarm the World Initiative by Evidence Action. And um, check out their website if you can and donate. But thank you so much and have a great evening. Yeah, likewise. Thanks. Thank you.